it's Wendy Townley, and um, I wear a handful of hats here in Omaha. Um, I'm a very proud UNO graduate, and uh, since 2008, I've been teaching part-time for the UNO School of Communication, which I absolutely love. Um, and then I also work as executive director of the Omaha Public Library Foundation. So I am here with a few other participants this morning. Um, we are resurrecting a panel that Jeremy organized 10 years ago um, for the first conference. And if you maybe noticed in the bottom of the uh, Zoom screen this morning, there was a little snapshot of the four of us at that time. Um, and I was thinking just of how life was so different 10 years ago compared to today. So our panel this morning is gonna discuss social media and so, so, social change as it related in 2010 and back today. So I'd like to introduce our other panelists and then I have a couple questions that I'm gonna to pose to them this morning. I will keep an eye on the chat as well. So if you have thoughts or questions for them, you are welcome to type those up. Um, first joining us is Nebraska Senator Megan Hunt who represents District 8 in our fine state. Hi Megan, good to see you. Hi Wendy, it's so good to be here with yeah. you again. Thank you. And then also we have Josie Loza. Um, she serves as the manager of student publications at UNO. She corrals the Gateway staff. Um, I'm a Gateway alum. And so that newspaper and that experience holds a very special place in my heart as well. So thank you ladies so much for joining us this morning. Um, I didn't get into your bios too much because I feel like the first couple questions will allow you to discuss that in more detail. Um, but the first question, Megan, let's go ahead and start with you. Um, when you think back 10 years ago, what social media platforms were you using at the time and how were you using them? Well, a lot has changed, as you've said. Um, yes. I, I consider myself a digital native. Um, I'm 34 and I'm part of kind of the first generation of people that came up growing up with a computer in their house. Um, you know, I started my first website when I was like my daughter's age, like 10. Mm -hmm. And I was on LiveJournal and MySpace and BBSs and, and listservs at a very young age. And so um, kind of this, the unique communication that we use in social media has always felt like sort of a native language to me as it's evolved and changed over the years and over the decades now, which is wild. Um, 10 years ago, I was kind of coming off of that like live journal, very early blogging type platforms and starting to come into a lot of the stuff that we're still using today, Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, that can't be 10 years old, but it's got to be close because it's more than 10 years old, I'm afraid it has to, to be say. More. Yeah, it's like 12 right, or 13. I'm thinking now my daughter's 10, and I know that I was posting before she was born. So, yes, I mean, that kind of reflects the overall arc of social media entrepreneurship in general, which is like it kind of started as this like democratized thing, like anybody can create an app, anybody can start a platform. And now, 10 years later, it's all kind of boiled down into two, like mm -hmm. Twitter and Facebook, which owns Instagram. So mm -hmm. that's where I am today with everybody else. And that's where I came from. Okay, thank you. And Josie, before I get to you, um, Jeremy, I have a little quest request for you. I see, I think I see our other panelist, Abby Jordan listed. Um, so if you could make her a panelist as well, so she can join us, if I'm seeing that correctly here in Zoom. Um, thank you. Okay, yeah, Josie. Look, okay, thank you. Josie, same question to you. When you're thinking back 10 years ago, um, what social media platforms were you using and how did you use them? Um, I considered myself a, a, I would say a native, but I'm more of an immigrant, a digital immigrant. I like, I like the difference. That's good. Only in that, um, you know, our, my first Google account, I think, or Yahoo email was like in high school, but we never really utilized it. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until maybe my latter year of, of college that I started to see MySpace really um, explode. And so for me, I had to learn it at a different capacity than what I was used to with traditional, you know, dial up internet. Mm -hmm. um, and so early on, um, you know, I 
was um, an entertainment reporter for the Omaha World Herald, and MySpace was really a go-to place for me to figure out what was happening, what the scene was like in Omaha for like local hip hop, but also um, things that were happening around town. Mm-hmm. And um, Twitter and Facebook were other go-tos. Um, just seeing how um, you know traditional media has really exploded when it comes to online and backpack journalism and understanding how to work remotely. Um, that has been kind of a saving grace always for me because I could use Twitter to contact readers directly, or they would contact me and let me know of events that were happening. And I'm still Mm -hmm. pretty much at that same capacity, um, with using Twitter and Facebook, um, still, um, the way the world has changed because of social media, Mm -hmm. um, and how we now have insight into different places around the world globally um, and how it's continually reshaped our mindset, I think is such a beautiful thing to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. And Abby, it's so good to see you. If you want to unmute yourself, please. And I'm like, oh, thank you. I'm sorry that I wasn't uh on earlier no, uh, 20 the theme for 2020 is grace and forgiveness on zoom oh, so you're ooh, fine <laughs> great great and i count myself in that group but thank you um everyone this is abby jordan who's joining us she was our other panelist 10 years ago at this conference and you um our founder of e creamery ice cream and gelato delicious here in omaha so i will pose that same first question to you Thinking back 10 years ago, um, what social media platforms were you using and how were you using them? Um, Well, I do not consider myself um, an early adapter or a native. I I was slow to to join. I remember seeing um, MySpace back then and being a little timid of it. And then, well, I guess that was a lot longer than that. But then Facebook, um, I, I I definitely was using Facebook, and I still have a very small presence on Twitter that I just kind of mm-hmm. pop in and out of. Although my husband sends me all of Megan's feeds every day, this <laughs> is <laughs> so proud of her, and is always like, "You have to read this. You have to read this." I know. Um, uh, but I do remember also uh, Big Omaha back in that in those yes. days. Um, I think uh, the founder from Foursquare came, and and we all thought you know we thought Foursquare was going to get so big, and so I think I, I really got on that and really you know but that, that, yes. was, that, that wasn't really the thing. Um, and Instagram for sure. I've been um, I really liked Instagram and really have. Um, that's probably the most that I've changed with over the mm-hmm. years. Um, and um, just, I think with having kids and some of that and connecting with old friends, I think with, with Instagram. And as far as the business goes, um, Facebook has changed throughout as we've gone as well, where we mm-hmm. used to just post things and definitely now we're spending some ad dollars on that platform for better or worse. Right. Who would have ever thought we'd be giving free platforms to use money? Like it's, it's when you think through that, but that it is part of advertising and PR budgets and it it can be money well spent for sure. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thanks, Abby. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next question. And we'll, we'll start again with Megan. So fast forward to today, what you're doing now, obviously we are all working in different spaces. We are living differently. We'll talk about the pandemic a little bit later um, with regards to social media, but thinking ahead to today and maybe with even in the past one to two years, how has your social media usage changed? Um, And um, what platforms are you using? We'd love to hear some about something more about that. And I think Megan, you're the great person to begin this conversation because you have always been very active on Twitter. I think you and I met through Twitter, honestly, and that big Omaha community. And then to see how you've kind of transitioned that platform now um, working as our state Senator. I think that I met all three of you women through social media initially. I mean, 
10 years ago, I was running a business making dresses and bouquets for brides all over the world. And I wrote a book about it. And Abby Jordan helped me have a launch party. She gave me a whole bunch of ice cream to use for the party. And Josie has always been a partner to me in media. Like, I know that you've given me a lot of opportunities to get press exposure. Same with Wendy. A lot of opportunities have come from your professional you know, relationship with me and all the different mm -hmm. jobs that you've had. And all of that honestly came from like Twitter probably and yeah. Facebook and just the connections that we used to have. Um, remember tweet ups like 10 yes. years ago? He, like Eric Downs is doing a lot of those, but like <laughs> somebody would post a hashtag like Omaha tweet up and then you yes. go, it's almost like a blind date. Like you yes, go that's to this perfect dive bar in Omaha or something. And there's Dusty Davidson and he's made a t-shirt for it. And like, it was just so innocent and pure back it then. Was. It was so um, honest and hopeful and entrepreneurial. And I think it kind of came out of everybody having an urge to share a story. Cause that's like what social media really is, is it's a form of communication. It's a form of writing. And with all of us having this platform with us all the time, we can be writing all the time. And mm -hmm. I certainly am now more than ever. So I started as a, as a tech entrepreneur in like a very female um, focused space, you know, in, in fashion. Um, and I, I worked in fashion for 12, 13 years. And I had no idea that I was going to end up working in politics. And I got elected to the Nebraska legislature in 2018. And like anybody who gets into politics, I know that I benefited in my election from my presence in the community as a business owner. But I think that the cherry on top, what really took it way beyond the finish line for me was my social media presence and my reputation as a strong voice on social media. Because whether you live in my neighborhood in Omaha, um, maybe something I've written or said has reached you through Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or an old blog post or even LinkedIn. Um, there's all these different kind of pockets and holes on the internet where we can find each other. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I leveraged those, those tools to, you know, advance my career in a way that actually felt completely organic at the time, which is what we're all trying to do with social media is kind of share a part of ourselves that is real and true and no bullshit. And mm -hmm. that's what I was always trying to do. And it ended up getting me here. And now I've got like all kinds of BS to deal with. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> a different I, shade of BS. <laughs> exactly. Um, I had one other thought, but it escapes me and I've been talking for a while. So I'll, okay. I'll just wrap it up there. Well, I, I appreciate your comment about authenticity because I think the individuals um, who have, um, I don't want to say succeed on social media, but have great engagement are those who are authentic individuals. And all three of you definitely rep represent that. Did you have your other thought? What I was going to say is a lot of people who think about running for office or who think about starting a business or who want to have more of a public presence in activism or volunteering, whatever it is, people who think that they want to have more, be more in the public eye, they think they have to change their presence on social media. Like they have to start talking differently or they have to act more professional. Mm -hmm. Or um, I've even asked people if they should hire a consultant to like write posts for them. And no, like all the stuff that we were saying 10 years ago about authenticity and transparency and how these platforms lend themselves to that, it is even more true now. Um, you know, there is so much darkness in social media. It, there's a lot of destructive forces, increasing depression, fake news, the alt-right, brands targeting us. If you can be authentic and if you can be yourself and let people know who you are through this little window into your life, that's gonna be more valuable than anything else you could do. Very well said. And there's so many different platforms that allow that. If you're not comfortable so much with text, but you're great with photos, hang out on Instagram for sure. For sure. Thanks, Megan. Okay, Josie, same question for you. Looking in recent years, how has your social media usage changed? Um, honestly, I, um, 
I used to use social media, as I had said before, as a way to connect. Um, oftentimes what I would do with social media, especially Twitter, I mean, when Megan brought up um, tweet ups, it made me just tickle with joy. <laughs> we totally need to have like a tweet up reunion. Um, but it's it's the fact that like being able to go to um, like a live concert or um, even like Kevin Hart, when Kevin Hart would come to the Funny Bone and, you know, he would say jokes and I could share them immediately. And having that live interaction with readers, I think, was dynamic because you were setting, you know, the tone of what. Um, my account was going to be like, what I was going to present to people, that goes back to authenticity, um, but also in the fact that, you know, those who had maybe never heard of him, he was getting exposure that way to a local audience for us. Um, I still use social media that way. Um, and I love everything that Megan had said about, you know, no, just being authentic and being real and not changing things up because we're attracted to people in the first place for who they are, right? So you're bringing yourself. Um, oftentimes I thought, you know, as I changed from nightlife and covering nightlife and moving over to Mamaha, which was the, um, still the Omaha World Herald's parenting uh, blog, if my tone should change. My readers joined me. Why? Because they followed me. And so I had to believe in what I had to offer, what I had to say was going to be truly something of substance and that they were keeping me relevant in the process. So I enjoyed that. I, I kind of grew up um, at the World Herald. And um, even now, you know, I'm working with UNO students and just seeing how they are utilizing social media. When I first stepped in to my role as publication manager at UNO, back in 2015, students were already tweeting, they were already going to events, they were already snapping, they were already doing these things, but to change that into, hey, this is your brand, you are your brand, this is your platform, here's how you can get these stories out, here's how you can build your audience, that was what I had to work with them on, just to think live, think immediacy, and then see if you can share that and like incorporate that the same way you're already utilizing it. And it's in a way where you're growing up with it, a lot of reporters, you know, especially as old heads had to learn it and it's scary, you know, it's a scary thing. You're already doing it. So why not do it well and just keep doing it. Um, so I'm like a big cheerleader for that. Um, and even during a pandemic, look, uh, we had a quarantine shutdown and I know we'll get to that, but I do want to make a note of kudos to the gateway staff for just being able to flip the switch so quickly you know, because they were thinking digital already. They were building their brand already. Um, and even me, like now I, um, I started a business called Lozafina <laughs> and it's health and wellness. Thank you. Um, and Where can we find you on social, Josie? <laughs> okay. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter, of course. Awesome as Losafina, L-O-Z-A-F-I-N-A. -A. Um, but it's using art um, as therapy and teaching people how that suppressed emotions that we probably are feeling, how to get them out. And I share a lot of my paintings and stuff on Instagram and social media, and they're selling like crazy because people support me, not mm -hmm. because I switch things up, but because I am still authentic and real. And mm -hmm. I think that is important. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you bring up a really good point, Josie, because I feel, I mean, I can only speak from how I use social media and what I'm observing and even with what I interact with my uh, journalism students at UNO with regards to it. It does seem that there seems to be a shift among a contingent that it's less about the likes and more about this is who I am. This is my story. If you like me, you're going to follow me. And if you don't, that's really okay because maybe I don't have content that you're interested in the first place. Along the same lines of you're not supposed to be best friends with every person you ever encounter. I think the pressure existed earlier on that we were all supposed to be our own walking, talking, personal brands. And it got really tiring really quick. And so now it's this is who I am exactly with, with is what you're describing. Could I add to that a little bit? Yeah, you may. That's where Megan spoke of like depression does happen. You know, yes. we, 
we are we are curating so much of our life when we have to take a moment snap it or take a photo and like make sure we have the best lighting we're not living the moment and yes. when you, you're missing valuable moments that i mean that messes with your psyche it, 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 you're constantly presenting what you think your audience wants when really your audience just wants you mm -hmm. so take the pressure off you know yeah well said well said thanks josie Okay, Abby, same question. How has your social media usage changed in the past 10 years? And if you have any thoughts to what Megan and Josie shared already. Yes, um, I, I, it has changed. And I think sort of um, what I had struggled with back then and was able to separate over uh, the last few years was e Creamery, the brand, and myself. So when um, we, our first Twitter account, the first Twitter account that I had or what, that I was a part of was the eCreamery Twitter account. So it was the eCreamery Twitter account with my face and, um, and, that, and at that point, it, there was a lot of talk about authenticity and people want like a face behind the brand and they want, they want to, um, they want to know uh, really from somebody who has started the brand, the messages. So we were, it was so hard for me to figure out because I am, I'm a very authentic person. And then to try to be like peddling my wares with my face, you know, it was like, no, I, this is hard. I can't do it. Um, because I'm very much behind the scenes in the e, at e Creamery. I'm very much operations. I'm very much make the ice cream, ship it, you know, all of that. And my partner Becky was we always it was marketing and sales, and you know, she was the one that was like it was easier for her to talk about me and what I was doing. And it was I could it was hard for me to talk about. I make this really great ice cream, and I sell it online. Like I didn't. I, I don't talk like that and I can't mm -hmm. put it. So there was a real disconnect there. So thank, thank goodness we have changed the way that looks and then just really separating those accounts. So separate, I remember when Pinterest came out and I was, and, and, and I was getting a little pressure from partners to start pinning for a cream and I was like, this is mine. This platform's mine. I need this for myself. Right. So, um, so eventually, you know, we all, everything split and it was, it was much better because we're able to have an e-creamery and, and we're, we have an e-creamery voice and it's, you know, um, we've never spent a ton of time on curating it. And to me, you know, that's fine. It's, it's the way it is. And for, and so just if, as long as I can be separate and, you know, my Instagram account is all me and mm -hmm. my interest and my face, you know, those are all me. So I just think that's a different perspective. And it was uh, uh, just kind of having to be a brand and having to be an individual person that wasn't yeah. a brand was, was, was something that I think we all learned. It was almost it as if we needed to ask permission to just be ourselves on social and yes. not push everything yes. constantly. Mm -hmm. um, we got into the mindset very quickly that that's all who we were. And then we realized, myself included, I'm sick of myself. <laughs> I, enough already. Enough. Mm -hmm. uh, Megan or Josie, did you have any follow-up thoughts before we move on to the next question? Anything else? Megan, if you want to unmute yourself, it's okay. I'll do that. Is that better? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I am sick to death of myself. I'm so <laughs> sick of myself. Like people who people who are not fans of me. We're not sick of you. No, we're thank not. You. <laughs> but you know, you uh, one thing Josie said was, you know, if you like me, you're gonna follow me. If you're not, you don't need to do that. Well, sometimes it's if you like me, you'll follow me. And if you hate me, you'll follow me and you'll tell me every single day. Yes. And like this is a side of social media that's also very, very real. Um yeah, and these people are like, oh, I'm so sick of you. And it's like, you're sick of me. I have to listen to myself even when I'm not speaking. And I am more sick of me than any of you, I promise. <laughs> that was my thought. Thank you. <laughs> 
Okay, next question moving down the list. Um, and we touched on it a little bit, but I want to dive a little deeper. So 10 years ago, when we gathered at UNO, we discussed how social media impacted personal lives and individual lives. Um, I, I, I'm reluctant to use the word private, um, but I, I want us to think in the lens of personal. Um, so how has social media impacted our personal lives today, 10 years later, when we just thinking about, thinking about moving through our days? Um, we've touched a lot on the professional side, but again, personal side. And Megan, we can start with you again if you're ready. Otherwise, we can go to Josie or Abby. Josie, do you have thoughts? Am I sure. muted? Um, no, I'm good. I'm yeah, seeing, go a, I'm seeing a, a fierce nod. <laughs> from Joe. Yeah, you go for it. When, um, when I started doing nightlife um, and opening myself up, I think, and in, in being very, um, you know, like, here's where I am, four square, come, come have a drink with me, yes. you know, kind of thing. Um, I really opened myself up to a lot of people and not necessarily the kind of people I wanted immediately. So, I mean, I've had issues where I had to deal with stalkers, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then when I flipped sides a little bit and was doing um, Mamaha, here I was sharing these intimate details, this personal space of like different challenges that my family had or different issues that were current, um, you know? And so it would be weird sometimes going to the grocery store and people stopping us and being like, recognizing my daughter and calling her by her name. And I'm like, whoa, you know? So it's like that level of understanding boundaries, like uh, figuring out what was good for me, how to protect my family, how to protect me, um, I thought was a really good learning lesson. But even in that years later, people still recognize me for the work that I've done at the World Herald. And it's really nice to have things come full circle. Um, you know, it, case in point would be junk stock. I was there when junk stock, you know, was barely getting started. And Sarah Alexander was, you know, um, you know, it, it was a brainchild that she was conceiving and, and, and bouncing as a soundboard I was for her at Zio's Pizzeria, right? We were just talking mm -hmm. about it randomly. And then all of a sudden, it's exploded to be what it is to the point where now I'm a vendor for her, you know, like I'm a vendor there. And I just think, you know, the way social media and branding can either pull us together or really make us think, rethink our boundaries, I mm -hmm. thought was pretty interesting with my dynamics there. Mm -hmm. That's a good, good choice of words, Josie, is boundaries, because that definitely has come up um, for so many people who have wanted to be more transparent on social media, just to share their story and also with the hopes that it might help other people too. Um, Abby, same question for you. Um, social media touching our personal lives then compared to now. Well, I, I, as I was thinking back, we, on that panel, um, we were discussing um, the way that, I think it was Facebook, um, we had lost a member of our community right near that time. Um, and her name is escaping me, but um, she was a young woman who owned a small business downtown and she had passed away just that like that the week before or the night before, or very, very soon before that. And how we all said we were kind of like putting flowers at her at her headstone basically like on Facebook like everybody sharing stories and um and I feel like as far as personal goes that has and boundaries that has become a little bit different um it is, and for me for for other people too and maybe this is is different but Facebook is kind of a place that I get um news about people I guess and then um and I think that's still hap happening. And I think people are getting on Facebook. Um, when I had something personal happen in my life, I put it on Facebook. I was, I, um, I had twins and one of them passed away at nine days old. And I didn't, I put it on Facebook right away. So people weren't asking me where my, I thought you had twins. And so it was like mm. a really good way to get that message out there. It was something where I would have never shared that personal information on Facebook. I would have never said, oh, you know, this is what happened. But 
as far as um, it was a super easy way to tell people what had happened without, you know, um, them feeling bad after they asked me what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think as far as, I, I mean, that was just a, just kind of talking about boundaries and um, what Josie said about uh, her family and recognizing yeah. people. And I think it has, that, that's been a, a good use of it and um, being able to share things with people that way. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for sharing um, that with us, Abby. That's that's a brave thing to talk about, not only here today, but I feel like on social media as well, because invariably your instinct is to to be really like news focused, get ahead of the story. So you're not getting these text messages and random calls from people and you're essentially having to kind of share that news over and over again. So that that is a different dynamic. And I do see that there are people who do use social media in that way and there can be good that come of it. Um, I, Megan mentioned that the name of the woman who passed away 10 years ago was Jessica Latham. Thank you. Thank and you. what yes. business was that? Because I am not recalling. It was Bellwether Boutique downtown. Okay. In the passageway. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And of oh. course, recently we lost Callie Baker too. Yes. Who, yes. Who was at the Omaha Community Foundation. And, um, right. You know, I shouldn't, I don't know if I should talk about it, but it's on my mind because Callie um, was such a very good, close friend and mentor, an important person in the life of Jessica Latham's daughter. Yes. After after Jessica passed, oh, wow. Callie really took um, a mothering role, honestly, for for Jessica's daughter. And so mm-hmm. I've really had that girl in my thoughts a lot. But yeah, not to not to cast a pall, but um, it's okay. You know, Abby's Abby's point about Facebook being kind of a central location where you you get this news like you get the news mm-hmm. through news channels but like this personal news we don't call each other anymore and tell each other that stuff like I don't go to anywhere in the community and hear this stuff from people who are my neighbors because we don't know our neighbors anymore as much as we used to mm-hmm. it's on Facebook that's kind of like the town square and the town bulletin board and yeah. um, you know a source of a lot of announcements like that mm-hmm. in terms of personal use of social media, for me, it has changed drastically. Um, 10 years ago, I was married. I had my first child. I had bought a home. I was a business owner. I was 23, 24. Like, I mean, and I thought my life was just going to go like that. Like I thought, well, I'm doing pretty well. Like, surely it will only get better from here. You know, like, really stupid early 20 something. No thought. more surprises. <laughs> surprises are done. Right. <laughs> I'm only going to get like richer and more happy. Right. Like that's yes. how, so stupid, but <laughs> you know, now I'm, I'm not married. I live in a tiny apartment. I'm, I have my dream job, which is wonderful, but I have more, um, honestly, like emotional and financial insecurity than I've ever had in my life. And like emotionally and mentally, it's like a very difficult place to be. And I think 10 years ago, I would have written about all that on social media, or I would have, um, transparent's not the word, because one thing I also like people to understand when we talk about transparency is that not everybody has the right to know everything about you. And if you hold things back, that doesn't mean you're not being transparent. And it doesn't mean it's a secret either. I mean, just because something um, isn't a secret doesn't mean it's everybody's business. So, you know, Josie pointing out like going to the grocery store and people recognizing her child. I don't mind it when people do that to me because I work in public service. And so when I go to the grocery store, people come up to me all the time at Target, people come up to me and say, oh, I'm having a problem with child support or I can't get my unemployment. And I give them my card and I say, we're gonna solve it for you. Cause that's literally my job. Like Mm -hmm. my job is to go to Target and help the people who ask me for help. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. My daughter hates it. My daughter hates it when we're out and someone says, oh, is this Alice? Like she just wants to be like a normal kid and not have that happen. And, you know, in my personal life, I've been through romantic relationships. Um, It's very hard to date when it's like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so at this point to me in 2020, 10 years after we last talked about this, 
to me, the most luxurious thing in the world is not posting something on social media. The most like luxurious, wonderful thing for me is to date somebody and have nobody know about it or to go on a vacation and not post it on Instagram. So Mm -hmm. people don't say, oh, you're in my city. Let's get dinner. Or like, how dare you leave? Because there's so many problems in the world. Like just, just (laughs) having people stay out of my life when I, when I want a boundary yeah, and feeling no guilt over it is the biggest luxury in the world to me. Yeah. Abby, did you have any follow-up thoughts? Oh, no, I, I did think that was, um, it is a luxury. And in fact, yeah. I decided to take the last 90 days of the year off of social media. Wow. Um, I did pop back on to Facebook, but I took everything off my phone. Um, uh, to, to learn more details about Callie, Callie's passing. I worked with her at four times when we were just so young in our young twenties. And she's just been such a great part of the community. So definitely mm-hmm. followed along and cheered her on. Um, but yeah, no, I, um, I find that a luxury too. And so, yeah. <laughs> and not that anybody's really it's just friends and whatever following me. I don't have any of the pressure that Megan has or any of the, I, most of the people that follow me are friends. Nobody it says, um, you know, I hate you. Please quit posting. <laughs> I just can't even imagine. Well, those people are out yeah. there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We just may not see them. And actually that brings up a really good question that came from the chat. Um, How do we deal with cyber bullying slash trolls slash whatever other thousand labels we have um, when we are open on social media? And I can open this up to either three of you, whoever wants to start. I know Megan, you have a very public role right now. Um, so I don't want to assume you have the most to say about it, but for any, any of you sharing with that, I mean, I've even been attacked on social media and I'm like, what, I don't even know. What am I posting my garden and my dogs? Like that's it. (laughs) Was the question about cyber bullying? Yeah. Yes. Um, that, that, or just trolls that seem to show up. Cause I think you also make and made a very good point that it, it's very true. I know in uh, legacy and online media, even the people who hate you are still going to watch you online. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you just have or, to, or listen to the radio, but yeah, just be thoughts on, on, on interacting with that. Don't interact with it. Just be focused on what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, my inner mantra is like, what other people think about me is none of my business. And then I said what I said, and I never say anything, not on purpose. It's like, I, I think about what I say. I know that it's consequential. I know that it gets widely consumed. And so if people, there's always going to be people who deliberately misunderstand you, who are reading to misunderstand, and they do not matter. Like they're, they have the right to do that. Like they have the right to dislike you. They have the right to think you're stupid. That's okay. There's a lot of people who I think are stupid and I don't have to tell them that, but like, they're just like that. It's okay. And you can't take it personally. Um, You have to realize that a lot of what people say is about them, not about you. Um, And if people are deliberately misunderstanding you, you can't, you can't beg them to, to be any different. Um, Mm -hmm. So don't say anything that you aren't going to stand by, um, be open to criticism, understand that not everybody who criticizes you is a troll or a bully. People can come to you with good faith, um, questions and problems and criticisms, and they deserve to be heard. They deserve to be taken seriously. They deserve answers. But when people are just being nasty, let them be nasty. Let Mm -hmm. their comments sit there for the whole world to see. So everyone can see how dumb and nasty they are. That's on them, not on you. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with you. Agreed. Agreed. They're doing it. It's like they're shouting at you in a public square. So it, everyone right, it else makes is seeing their bad. behavior. Agreed. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, let's brighten the air a little bit and talk about the pandemic. <laughs> but I think it's relevant with where we are. Um, I don't even know how many days we're into it. I've lost count. Um, but we are seeing, and I include myself, we're looking at social media, not, and I don't mean like 
scrolling, but we're perhaps engaging and interacting with it more than ever, using it to host live events um, because of the situation we're in. What are the pros and what are the cons of this? Because I do think, and, and this kind of dovetails into the last question that I have is where is social media headed? Because I feel personally that the past several months has is shaping what social media's next uh, iteration is gonna look like. So if we can start with you, Megan, if you want um, on that, if you're comfortable. Okay, Abby or Josie, your thoughts. Let me think about it for a minute. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll kind of jump in. I think that uh, I have social media fatigue at this mm -hmm. point, and that's why I took off my, my, these last, you know, trying to just kind of cleanse and um, focus on what I need to focus on for, for right now, having, you know, kids that are home or kids that are on their way back to school and what that means with the numbers going. I mean, you know, there's just, I, I, one morning last week, I just, said I my husband asked me why are you so stressed and I was like well on top of sending the kids back on top of doing the things I was like on top of like running this business and having people rely on me and on top of the things the pandemic and Trump I was just like, like what so he did he's like okay so he encouraged me I, I just uh with social media and with you know all the different um social media platforms, I've been, um, it's been a real divider, you know, in these last mm -hmm. whatever. So um, I just don't want to see that about people who have been so misinformed. And I don't, I don't want to see that side of them there. I see enough signs in the yards of people that I'm like, shoot. But um, I, I, um, so I took it off and I, so I, so I, so I quit watching it. And I and he told me, Scott, my husband was like, what you should do is get people registered. So we set up like a registration, like station in our front yard. So when people drove by, wow. my kids set up phones and they would just like ask, are you registered to vote? <laughs> and ask people. And, and I kept thinking about like, how can I take the good messages of Instagram and like put them on a sign in my front yard, you know, that's like, and it's, it's the signs that I have in my front yard. That's like, we believe that science is real. You know, the things that you're thinking in 2020, like, why do I have to say these things? The sign mm -hmm. says I care. Like, why do I have to tell people that mm -hmm. I care about people? So I guess, I don't know if I went off the rails there or not, but. Oh, you did entirely, but I'm loving every minute of it. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I think we all are. No, oh, but I, it's, it's interesting your comment because it's what you're describing is you want to take digital and go back to analog. Yeah. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing. I was sitting here um, before we got started this morning, printing actual photos on my little HP sprocket because I'm tired of having all these photos that I are just on my phone. So you're speaking, you're speaking loud and clear with regards to that. Um, we've got a couple minutes left. Um, so I'll pose this last question to Megan and Josie when we're thinking about use of social media during pandemic. Um, pros and cons of it, but then also how is it shaping social media for the next 10 years? I agree with what Abby seemed to be saying about burnout. I mean, for those of us who are not employed by institutions that have been deemed essential, um, hospitals, prisons, meatpacking plants, teachers, you know, and pretty much everybody, especially in Nebraska, is back to work now. But there was a long period of time where we were not working we were home day after day after day just scrolling on the phone and you know social so sociality being social became entirely defined and mandated by two or three or four tech giants they became the gateway to all of our access to each other so to me it seems obvious that like unless you're sharing a gofundme link for your medical care or something there can be no good coming from social media platforms. Um, I think that one of the main purposes of social media is to draw attention to yourself. 
We use it to promote ourselves for better, for worse. And it's hard to think of a worse time right now to do that. Um, it's really hard. You know, I mentioned earlier, like going on a vacation and not telling anybody. Well, that's even in the best of times. Think about now, like there's something to be said for like your individual joy and your humanity and your right to express um, what's going on in your reality. But like, if I went on a hypothetical vacation, how could I post pictures of that right now? Like mm -hmm. I, I scroll through my camera reel on my phone looking for something to post so that I can get likes so that I can feel good for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's just like all the time we've had at home to ponder and think about the consequences of this. It's just only negative to me. Mm -hmm. It's only negative to me. Like 10 years ago, I think I would have told you that social media would democratize us and be like a great force for equality, um, that progress would happen and it wouldn't be obstructed or censored by the powerful. But I think that's exactly what's happened is mm -hmm. our communication has become regulated by just a couple really powerful businesses and organizations. And it's become, instead of like this innovative um, compulsion to share, it's become more like the Freudian death drive, you know, mm -hmm. like the, the drive towards self-destruction. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, I'm not saying 100% of the time, but more often than this not, pandemic, it yeah, it's just brought that all to light for me. Yeah. And that we want to waste our time, that however we complain about it, we do find satisfaction in the endless circular arguments and scrolling mm -hmm. and reading the same takes over and over and over again. We get some kind of fulfillment from that. Mm -hmm. So what's all that about? And this pandemic has made me reflect on that a lot. Like it's easy to watch this like social media thing on the, uh, Netflix right now. What's oh, that the social movie? dilemma. Yeah, the social, you watch that and you're like, oh, this is horrible. Mm -hmm. I have to be very self-aware of this. But the truth is, it feels good. We're on Facebook all day and Twitter all day because we're getting something out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like I said, it's it's confronted us with a lot of destructive forces. But at the same time, um, I think a lot of the drive to share has been about um, a story and, mm -hmm. and having a story to share and that this is a platform that gives light to um, revolution, to change. We learn about um, resistance and protests and people rising up through social media. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it can be destructive and it can be productive, but um, it is not like it was 10 years ago. And yeah. the state of things today in 2020 makes me very uncomfortable making a prediction about what it will be like yeah. in 10 years. I think that we will be largely off social media. My daughter who's 10, when I was 10, I was learning HTML and CSS. My daughter doesn't want any social media. She doesn't want Instagram. She doesn't want anybody to know what she's doing. And mm -hmm. this is consistent with a lot of her friends. A lot of people in that generation who I talk to, they see what it's done to their parents. And mm -hmm. to them, they don't want to use it like we do. So yeah. my question will be, how will the next generation use social media and recreate it? Um, yeah. yeah. Time will tell for sure. Thank you. Josie, in the last couple minutes, I know we're a, a few minutes over, but I think this is an important topic to address. Your thoughts? I, you know, honestly, Megan hit the nail on the head. I mean, that was so beautifully... Um, explained. I think oftentimes um, we, we were so caught up with technology. We were inundated with news um, and our entertainment. And I think life slowed down during quarantine mm -hmm. and it helped us heal those who needed to heal. It helped us um, be around family, reflect um, and it gave us a glimpse of what life could be like without, I think, um, all the hustle and bustle of work, right? Um, Very true. On the flip side, scrolling is something out of boredom I noticed that I was doing. So I had to put limitations on it. You know, I had to, and we, we have that capability where we can limit ourselves. We can set settings on our phone. We can delete apps. We can go away from it but it's having that willpower to want to do those things. Um, I've, 
I, I've been focused more so on hobbies. What, what hobbies do I have? How can I decompress? Because sitting down and binge watching Netflix all day is not going to do the trick, yeah. right? And well, I remember thinking, when I ran into you at Michael's <laughs> shopping for craft projects. Like, what are we going to do today? <laughs> yes, I remember this. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think for me, it's, it is interesting seeing how a lot of younger people and even my children, 12 and, and nine, they, um, they want interactive play, but if you're doing remote learning from the start of your morning until, you know, eight hours later, six hours later, you're done. Mm -hmm. You want to have a sit down conversation with mom. You want to eat at the dinner table. You want to go out and play with your friends. You want, you know, that's where that's coming from and, and paying attention to, you know, how we're learning, um, you know, how these young people are learning. It truly is going to affect how society is going to progress. So mm -hmm. I, I, I am just an observer. I'm a spectator and I'm excited to see what's going to happen next. I am too. I am too. And, and I agree with everyone. I don't think we can have any really good grounding on what to predict 